This is where you'll happen. Welcome to the Beaton Institute at Cape Breton University. The Beaton Institute has been in operation for almost 60 years, and we collect and preserve historically significant records that reflect the economic, cultural, social, and political history of Cape Breton Island. Hi, I'm Heather Sparling, and I'm the Canada Research Chair in Musical Traditions and an Associate Professor of Ethnomusicology here at Cape Breton University. We'd like to introduce you to the Beaton Institute and its resources and how they've helped to support the research of people in folklore, Celtic, and music, traditional music studies here at the university. I'm Jane Arnold, archivist at the Beaton Institute. Uh, I work with faculty and students both on campus and I also work with the wider Cape Breton community uh, to help both scholars and uh, community members research Cape Breton history and their heritage. And I have the opportunity to collaborate on many different projects uh, such as a variety of ones that we've done with uh, Dr. Heather Sparling. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the research that I've done that have, has drawn on some of the resources here at the Beaton Institute. So my research works on uh, Gaelic song in Nova Scotia, so I've used some of the extraordinary audio recordings here, uh, as well as interviews, and Machtala newspaper, which is a Gaelic newspaper that ran out of Sydney in the late 1800s until the early 1900s and includes a Gaelic song column. I've been doing research more recently on traditional dance and step dance in Cape Breton, and I've partnered with the Beaton Institute and the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa in order to digitize the LeBlanc collection of dance materials that were documented in the 1980s in parts of Cape Breton. Barbara LeBlanc is a professor at another university, but those materials, which include videos, uh, audio interviews, and textual documents, were inaccessible until they were digitized and are gradually being made available through the online archives here at the Beaton. We hosted the North Atlantic Fiddle Convention in 2015, which was an international conference involving fiddle, dance, and Gaelic song scholars, and we worked with the Beaton Institute to create the Celtic Music Digital Archive Project, which is also an online archive, making materials accessible that would otherwise not be to people unless they came here. And I've also been working on Atlantic Canadian disaster songs, which resulted in a digital exhibit that is now touring museums, schools, and libraries around the province. And I use the photographic collection here at the Beaton to illustrate some of the songs in that project. Our Sound and Moving Image collection began to be collected in the mid-1950s by Sister Margaret Beaton and other staff members uh, continued to add to that collection. And in it we have Gaelic songs, stories, poetry. Uh, it's a very rich resource that has been slowly being digitized uh, over the years at the Centre for Cape Breton Studies. A couple recent donations have been uh, coming into the Sound and Moving Image collection, and that includes the Rodeo Records collection. It includes some of the earliest Cape Breton commercial recordings and was developed between 1949 and 51. So working with faculty members like Heather Sparling uh, has really pushed the archive to improve our access and preservation to our archival content, where we've taken a lot of our archival records that uh, currently weren't very accessible, and now you can find uh, digital content such as as sound recordings, moving images, photographs, manuscript groups, either listed online or you actually have access to the digital content. So that's been a great step forward for the access and preservation at the archive. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the research that my colleagues have uh, been involved with that have drawn on Beaton resources as well. Richard McKinnon uh, has been drawing on materials from the Beaton Institute in order to inform the Dictionary of Cape Breton English that he's producing with English professor Bill Davey. Chris McDonald is doing research on the piano accompaniment tradition in Cape Breton and has been drawing on resources at the Beaton such as interviews uh, with musicians, uh, audio recordings of radio shows that feature performers, uh, pianists and fiddlers that he might not otherwise be able to hear, LPs and 78s that are otherwise inaccessible, and newspaper advertisements, articles, columns. Uh, in order to inform him about the history of music in Cape Breton and the experiences of music here. Ian Brody has been working on a project about the Old Trout Funnies, which is a Cape Breton comic, the original issues of which are held here at the Beaton Institute, and that has resulted in a book and an exhibit. Marcia Ostashevsky has been working on historically underrepresented cultures in Cape Breton and has developed a website, diversitycapebreton.ca, for which the Beaton produced some of the material, 
and for which Marcia drew on the beaten in order to find documentation about groups such as the Ukrainians, the Polish, the Lebanese, and other communities. Uh, the Beaton Institute is located in the Student Culture and Heritage Centre at Cape Breton University. We are open to the public and it's best to check our website for our public hours. You can also visit us at beateninstitute.com or cbu.ca slash beaten for more information. If you would like more information about our programs in Celtic, Gaelic, traditional music or folklore, please feel free to contact me, Heather Sparling, or visit the CBU website. Cape Breton Island is well known as a centre of Celtic culture, seen with the popularity of events such as Celtic colours. What I want to talk a little bit about today is in a sense how Cape Breton became Celtic, that is how and why Celtic peoples came to Cape Breton in the 19th century. Around 1800, the total population of Cape Breton Island was about 2,500. By the middle years of the 19th century, the population of the island exceeded 50,000 people. The main reason for this was the arrival of 20,000 gales from the western islands and highlands of Scotland. Why did this massive number of people cross the Atlantic? This had to do with transformations that were occurring in the western highlands and islands of Scotland. In the 18th century, the imposition of uh, state power altered the cultural autonomy of the Gales. At the same time, the highlands were being economically integrated into the capitalist economy of Britain. And this resulted in the dislocation of thousands of people from communal farmlands. The net effect of this process, which runs uh, over a century, is long-term massive outmigration. Cape Breton received a considerable number of these migrants. The pace of migration to Cape Breton Island reached its high point in the late 1820s and early 1830s. When this was happening, the prospects for settlers had actually diminished considerably. In general, access to land was more plentiful for uh, earlier settlers. And the resources of settlers uh, tended to be greater amongst those who arrived earlier. So you have two things happening. Two groups of uh, settlers, frontlanders who occupied fertile intervale along lake shores and rivers, and those who settled rocky upland areas where prospects uh, were not as great and often where settlers were forced to supplement farm incomes by working off farm. Often people worked as fishers uh, and increasingly by the middle years of the 19th century as uh, coal miners. 
Sons and daughters also supplemented household incomes by working uh, far afield in places such as Boston, uh, for example, where women uh, worked as domestic servants and many men from Cape Breton uh, set wages back home when working in, for example, construction. So the household economy that is emerging uh, in the 19th century is deeply embedded in the larger industrial world. So Gaelic communities that are being established are on the one hand very close-knit, shaped by a process of chain migration where family members joined one another on Cape Breton Island. And then on the other hand, these close-knit communities were part of a wider uh, industrial world that would indelibly uh, shape Cape Breton Island itself during the second half of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. The community solidarities that were forged in close-knit communities in the 19th century, which really emerged out of uh, this history of migration and settlement, also played a major role in shaping Cape Breton culture into the 20th century and became embedded in a multi-ethnic Cape Breton identity during the 20th century. Follow your passion for music to a world-class island destination, immersing yourself in its rich culture and deeply rooted musical traditions. Cape Breton University is home to Canada's only undergraduate music major focused on traditional music. Learn from some of Cape Breton Island's renowned performers. Live and study in communities where traditional music thrives every day. Let an optional minor in business help you find your place in the multi-billion dollar music industry. CBU, this is where you'll happen. Hello there, I'm Professor Chris McDonald, the Professor of Music and Ethnomusicology here at Cape Breton University. And I'm here with uh, Christopher Jones, who is the lab technician here at the Digitization Lab. And I thought I'd talk first about what the Digitization Lab is. Um, here in Cape Breton, we are known for having a very rich and uh, deeply rooted uh, history in culture and folklore. And we also have a wonderful archive here, the Beaton Institute, and that has a treasure trove of materials that uh, run the gamut of early 78 recordings right up to um, the latest uh, types of recordings. And in 2006, uh, Professor Richard McKinnon, a folklorist, was granted a Canada Research Chair in Intangible Cultural Heritage. And the idea was we need a facility that can deal with um, this great treasure trove of uh, cultural materials. So the idea was to build a digitization lab that could take these, um, these old recordings, videotapes, and so on, and preserve them from you know, the inevitable degradation over time. And we can pretty much digitize almost any format. And uh, Chris, you, you can talk a bit about what, uh, what we can do. Here at the Center for Cape Breton Studies, we're able to deal with multiple formats in video as well as multiple formats in audio, ranging from VHS um, to Umatic with video as well as in audio, we can deal with uh, records as well as cassettes or even reel-to-reel uh, -reel audio. And uh, the Digitization Lab is attached to uh, what we call the Rotor Rotary Music Performance Room, which is uh, a space that can be used as a performance space. It's a fully outfitted uh, recording studio, and it has a special flooring for um, dancers of various kinds. And uh, that is where we can bring people from the community into the lab, and uh, we can do various kinds of research or various kinds of preservation, whether it be music, dance, uh, storytelling, and uh, other sorts of oral formats that uh, will be best preserved in this way. So what kind of research do we do here at the Digitization Lab? I'll run you through a couple of projects that we've been working on. 
Uh, I've been working on uh, the distinctive Cape Breton piano accompaniment style that uh, goes with the uh, fiddle and dance tradition here in Cape Breton. So some of the things I was doing included interviewing pianists and other musicians here at the lab. Uh, it included going to the Beaton and finding old recordings, many of which are long out of print and inaccessible, and having them digitized, uh, both for my own use and for uh, public use. And then as I gathered the information and the story about the, the piano style started to emerge, the question was how to make use of this material in a way that the public can use. And what we decided to do was to um, produce a film in which we interviewed some key pianists. Uh, we focused on Doug McPhee, who's the great uh, soloist uh, from the area. And we put together a film called Doug McPhee and the Cape Breton's Celtic Piano Style. As, as one outcome that would be um, out there for public consumption. Another project that developed here at the Digitization Lab is Richard McKinnon, who is a folklorist. He looked at protest songs from the industrial years of Cape Breton, and he, he dug up a whole number of um, lyrics to songs that had long been lost um, that were produced here in Cape Breton. And to sort of bring them back to life, he used the Digitization Lab uh, to record them as performed by uh, young and contemporary Cape Breton musicians who wrote music for these songs. We were quite fortunate to be able to ask multiple musicians from the local community to come in to work on this project and I think they were all very impressed to the caliber of equipment and the facility that we have here at Cape Breton University. Another project that was uh, done here at the Digitization Lab was uh, a project on Atlantic Canadian disaster songs by ethnomusicologist Heather Sparling. And uh, she managed to collect hundreds of mining disaster, uh, airplane disaster, um, shipwreck disaster songs uh, from the area. And she put together a digital museum exhibit, which is now touring around in places like the Glace Bay Miners Museum and the Nova Scotia Museum of Industry. Yes, it was a very interesting project to get to work with, and we were really lucky um, to be able to collaborate with MediaSpark, which is a local media um, design company. We were able to integrate videos as well as games and be able to actually display all of the audio content on the kiosk. There are many other exciting projects that have been developed here in the Digitization Lab. Uh, among them, uh, ethnomusicologist Marcia Ostashevsky uh, produced an exhibit of Ukrainian material culture uh, through the Beaton, through the digitization lab that was uh, displayed at the Lyceum. And uh, folklorist Ian Brody um, used the Beaton and the digitization lab to help put together uh, a book and a display uh, about uh, the old trout funnies, the uh, Paul McKinnon cartoon that uh, was popular in the 1970s and 80s. So these are some examples of what we're doing at the digitization lab and we're looking forward to uh, finding new projects and uh, helping the Cape Breton community to commemorate and to preserve and to display its culture, both new and old. Follow your passion for music to a world-class island destination, immersing yourself in its rich culture and deeply rooted musical traditions. Cape Breton University is home to Canada's only undergraduate music major focused on traditional music. Learn from some of Cape Breton Island's renowned performers. Live and study in communities where traditional music thrives every day. Let an optional minor in business help you find your place in the multi-billion dollar music industry. CBU, this is where you'll happen.
Welcome to the Beaton Institute at Cape Breton University. The Beaton Institute has been in operation for almost 60 years and we collect and preserve historically significant records that reflect the economic, cultural, social and political history of Cape Breton Island. Hi, I'm Heather Sparling and I'm the Canada Research Chair in Musical Traditions and an Associate Professor of Ethnomusicology here at Cape Breton University. We'd like to introduce you to the Beaton Institute and its resources and how they've helped to support the research of people in folklore, Celtic, and music, traditional music studies here at the university. I'm Jane Arnold, archivist at the Beaton Institute. Uh, I work with faculty and students both on campus and I also work with the wider Cape Breton community uh, to help both scholars and uh, community members research Cape Breton history and their heritage. And I have the opportunity to collaborate on many different projects uh, such as a variety of ones that we've done with uh, Dr. Heather Sparling. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the research that I've done that have, has drawn on some of the resources here at the Beaton Institute. So my research works on uh, Gaelic song in Nova Scotia, so I've used some of the extraordinary audio recordings here, uh, as well as interviews, and Machtala newspaper, which is a Gaelic newspaper that ran out of Sydney in the late 1800s until the early 1900s and includes a Gaelic song column. I've been doing research more recently on traditional dance and step dance in Cape Breton, and I've partnered with the Beaton Institute and the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa in order to digitize the LeBlanc collection of dance materials that were documented in the 1980s in parts of Cape Breton. Barbara LeBlanc is a professor at another university, but those materials, which include videos, uh, audio interviews, and textual documents, were inaccessible until they were digitized and are gradually being made available through the online archives here at the Beaton. We hosted the North Atlantic Fiddle Convention in 2015, which was an international conference involving fiddle, dance, and Gaelic song scholars, and we worked with the Beaton Institute to create the Celtic Music Digital Archive Project, which is also an online archive, making materials accessible that would otherwise not be to people unless they came here. And I've also been working on Atlantic Canadian disaster songs, which resulted in a digital exhibit that is now touring museums, schools, and libraries around the province. And I use the photographic collection here at the Beaton to illustrate some of the songs in that project. Our Sound and Moving Image Collection began to be collected in the mid-1950s by Sister Margaret Beaton and other staff members uh, continued to add to that collection. And in it we have Gaelic songs, stories, poetry. Uh, it's a very rich resource that has been slowly being digitized uh, over the years at the Centre for Cape Breton Studies. Uh, a couple recent donations have been uh, coming into the Sound and Moving Image Collection and that includes the Rodeo Records Collection. It includes some of the earliest Cape Breton commercial recordings and was developed between 1949 and 51. So working with faculty members like Heather Sparling uh, has really pushed the archive to improve our access and preservation to our archival content. Where we've taken a lot of our archival records that uh, currently weren't very accessible and now you can find uh, digital content such as sound recordings, moving images, photographs, manuscript groups, either listed online or you actually have access to the digital content. So that's been a great step forward for the access and preservation at the archive. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the research that my colleagues have uh, been involved with that have drawn on Beaton resources as well. Richard McKinnon uh, has been drawing on materials from the Beaton Institute in order to inform the Dictionary of Cape Breton English that he's producing with English professor Bill Davey. Chris McDonald is doing research on the piano accompaniment tradition in Cape Breton and has been drawing on resources at the Beaton such as interviews uh, with musicians, uh, audio recordings of radio shows that feature performers, uh, pianists and fiddlers that he might not otherwise be able to hear, LPs and 78s that are otherwise inaccessible, and newspaper advertisements, articles, columns, uh, in order to inform him about the history of music in Cape Breton and the experiences of music here. Ian Brody has been working on a project about the Old Trout Funnies, which is a Cape Breton comic, the original issues of which are held here at the Beaton Institute, and that has resulted in a book and an exhibit. Marcia Ostashevsky has been working on historically underrepresented cultures in Cape Breton and has developed a website, diversitycapebreton.ca, for which the Beaton produced some of the material and for which Marcia drew on the Beaton in order to find documentation about groups such as the Ukrainians, the Polish, the Lebanese, and other communities. Mm -hmm. uh, the Beaton Institute is located in the Student Culture and Heritage Centre at Cape Breton University. We are open to the public and it's best to check our website for our public hours. You can also visit us at beatoninstitute.com 
or cbu.ca slash Beaton for more information. If you would like more information about our programs in Celtic, Gaelic, traditional music, or folklore, please feel free to contact me, Heather Sparling, or visit the CBU website. Is this, um, is the mic all set? Live. And people are yeah. listening to me ask if the mic is all set. I love that. So I'm going to call our morning together. So bienvenue, Falche, um, welcome, Oop, Jalasi. Um, did I get them all? Uh, we're very happy to have you here at Cape Breton University and in these wonderful facilities at the Beaton Institute, which are located on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Um, what we're doing today is we're having a North Atlantic Fiddle Convention workshop on performance studies, and we're going to be starting with our keynote presentation by Anna Birch. Um, I wanted to thank the Beaton Institute for hosting our event today, and also thank the Centre for Sound Communities and the Centre for Cape Breton Studies for providing equipment and personnel that are providing the live stream today. And if you're joining us on live stream, then we welcome you as well. And we hope that um, people visiting online will provide their questions via social media, as well as um, having questions from the general audience. Uh, so this event um, stemmed from the last North Atlantic Fiddle Convention that we hosted here at Cape Breton University in 2015. And I don't know how we got onto this, but Ian Russell and I decided that wouldn't it be a brilliant idea to have a series of workshops in between conventions. So, First, I'd like to say that everybody is very welcome to come to the next convention, which will be in Aberdeen in July 2018, from July 11th to the 15th, and the call for papers has just come out. So you're welcome to start thinking about your papers you'd like to submit for that. Um, but there's a bit of a distance between the two con uh, conventions, so we thought it might be useful to kind of maintain momentum and build networking to have a series of workshops in between the two. And what we decided to do was to organize those around memory, since memory is such a con fundamental concept to traditional music and dance. And we thought we would introduce different disciplinary approaches to memory in the, with the idea that we would inspire different thinking about traditional music and dance and the ways that people are approaching their research. So our first uh, workshop, which was held last year in Aberdeen, was on cognitive science and how the brain remembers. And then earlier this year, we had another workshop in Aberdeen on digital humanities and how the computer remembers. And now we're finishing here with a workshop on performance studies and how the body remembers. Uh, I'm very grateful for funding from the AHRC, the, um, one of the research councils in the UK who provided a networking grant to um, provide the funding for today and tomorrow's workshop. And that was supplemented by funding by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, which allowed us to add on some workshops yesterday on writing about music and writing music, and gave us some funding to be able to bring in students uh, to come to this event. So we're very pleased to have a number of people here from across North America and from overseas. Uh, I think that's all I need to tell you before I introduce Professor Anna Birch. So I'm going to introduce her and her presentation. She's going to be introducing performance studies to us. We're very, very excited to have Anna here presenting for us. She's a feminist scholar who's interested in hidden histories of women's achievements uh, and interested in work that it, it addresses issues of inclusion and diversity. She's a practice-led researcher who is a theater and film scholar. And we quite deliberately wanted to work with people who were from sort of outside of the traditional music and dance fields. She's done work as a play producer, a director, and a playwright. She's produced and directed films. She's edited, co-edited, and authored numerous publications, including co-editing performing site-specific theater, politics, place, and practice. She was the guest co-editor of Contempor Contemporary Theater Review on site specificity and mobility. She was the co-editor of Mediating Practices, Performance as Research and In Through Mediation. And she is the co-editor of Performance Research History, Pageants and Pioneers from Hotspit to Women's Suffrage Drama. 
She's the artistic director and founding member of Fragments and Monuments Performance and Film Company. And she's produced and directed a series of projects in public spaces, theaters, and galleries with a focus on how site-specific performance and film can develop and challenge the way we think about gender. And she uses iterative performance and film, as well as book publishing and internet broadcasting to work through these ideas. And this has resulted in an ongoing and living monument to Mary Wollstonecraft. And she has been the co-convener for Practices Research Working Group, uh, with, which is part of the International Federation of Theater Research. So I'd like to welcome Professor Anna Birch. Thank you very much, Heather. And thank you very much for making all this happen and for a very generous introduction. Welcome, everybody. It's absolutely marvellous to be here. And um, I just want to say thank you to the Beaton Institute because citing this particular presentation on the archive and documentation in this wonderful resource, I think, is, is absolutely perfect. And I think it's going to be very generative for our work together over the next couple of days. So I'm going to set out some um, thoughts that I've had from my experience of working um, as a theatre and film director. Before I do that, I just want to say that um, I've been on the uh, faculty at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland for seven years, since 2010, and my role there was to uh, manage the, and coordinate the PhD programme, to do my own personal research and to develop the theatre and drama um, research at that conservatoire. And for any of you who want to uh, discuss that with me, I'm really interested because it's a very interesting um, relationship between theatre, drama and music. Our PhD cohort is very interdisciplinary, which I'm very excited about. And I think at the last count, there's about 30 PhD students there. So, um, good. Okay, so... As many of you are already aware, how the body remembers or is remembered is a tricky subject and one that challenges artists from different angles. I'm looking forward to working with you on this conundrum. My presentation is arranged around my own work as a theatre director and scholar. I began directing very, very early because I went to a school that had a theatre and since then, I've worked in street theatre, comedy theatre, um, theatre collectives. My work with writers to develop new plays shifted in the late 1990s when I started my uh, company, Fragments and Monuments, with a Dutch sonographer. So there's sort of European sensibility there about working outside, which contributed to my work because I had been working in theatre-based venues and um, it was that collaboration, basically, between uh, theatre design and new writing that took me into location and place as a really important factor for my um, approach. I've written about the impact of this recontextualization, and cultural studies was very formative to me, um, particularly a theorist called Stuart Hall, who's being very remembered at the moment in his archival work. And I've got some um, resource about him, which I might pepper in later, because I can see some recognition, but it's not a lead theme that I'll be developing today. Um, film studies was informative to understand femi feminist approaches to analysis and deconstruction because for theatre it was quite early on, um, talking about early 90s to now, so there's been a lot of progress in um, uh, bodies and, of knowledge and thinking basically, which I hope to share some of it with you today. Of course theatre studies has tended to focus on history in the dominant canon, which I'll be coming back to, and western plays, whereas performance studies has a very different focus to that. It, as a discipline it puts a spotlight on performance and was developed by two experts, one in theatre um, Richard Schechner and the other an anthropologist and obviously um, many of you are familiar with the anthropology approach to the other so there's quite an interesting extra layer to that which we might get on to later when I discuss Brechtian um, methods of work and that's very tied into um, performance studies. 
The spotlight shines on all forms of performance to include everyday performance, walking on the high street, for example, the performance of food, for example, the ritual of cooking and eating a meal. Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet is a scholar of performance and Jewish studies born in 1942 in Toronto, and she notes about performance, presence, liveness, agency, embodiment and event are at the heart of the study of performance. This interdisciplinary um, approach has been promulgated by Professor Richard Schechner at New York University in his book Performance Studies and Introduction. Now that book has been reprinted in the last few years and it's got a fantastic website attached to it. Very, very, very useful uh, resource. And I'm going to show a video clip now of <coughs> Schechner with Heather's help. Um, and I just want to frame that video clip because um, what can I say? Perhaps I'll just leave you to watch it. But this is, this, is a, this is a thing in itself, Richard Schechner Performance Studies. And I will hope in my presentation to unpick his contribution, but to also profile the um, raft of scholars that have contributed to this epistemology. Performance studies is a field of academic study or endeavor. It's a whole world, and it's based on a certain theoretical considerations. If you exist, you're part of being. But everything that exists also does something. It's in motion. Not only human beings, but everything. If things are in motion, they are actually performing. They're doing something. If you're showing what you're doing, you're performing. So for example, somebody is crossing a street, they're just doing that. Somebody in a movie is crossing a street, they're showing that they're crossing the street, it's recorded by the camera, and it may be part of an art film or a documentary film. If you study how someone crosses that street, how it is filmed, how it is integrated into an artwork, then that is performance studies. Very simply put, performance studies looks at, examines, interprets, and analyzes all different kinds of performances, aesthetic, social, political, in sports, and of course, uh, what happens in daily life. Performance studies also is an academic discipline and it has a history. It began, from my point of view, it, at NYU, in the 1970s, was institutionalized at NYU in 1980 when we changed the name of our department from drama to performance studies. There's a second strand that uh, began at Northwestern University. Now Northwestern's brand of performance studies uh, derives basically from rhetoric, from speech, from communications, and has that kind of resonance to it. NYU's began from uh, the confluence of theater and anthropology, critical studies, gender studies, and things of this sort, post-structuralism. So these two strands have moved closer and closer. They've interwoven with each other. They're quite close together now, and they form the general uh, rope of performance studies, <coughs> consisting of two or more strands. Some of the key figures from <coughs> Northwestern would be uh, Dwight Conkergood or Shannon Jackson, and from NYU would be Barbara Kirshen Black Gimblet, Diana Taylor, Jose Munoz. And behind all of this are several uh, social thinkers and anthropologists such as Clifford Gertz and Victor Turner. Good, thanks, Heather. Okay, so there's a number of other clips available. And these provide a multifaceted approach to the often difficult task of defining the coordinates of both the field of academic study as well as a lens through which to assess and document cultural practices and embodied behaviour. For Schechner, bodies come before language and embodied behaviour is primary. He also reminds us that the word text derives from textile to weave, 
taking threads to make a cloth as a form of performance. That, he suggests, is embodied behaviour, so we might find that useful. Importantly, both artists and academics circulate around the performance studies community. An iconic performance piece by Guillermo Gomez Pena, Pena and Coco Fusco titled The Couple in the Cage, a Guaitaneo Odyssey, is a re re reverses the colonial gaze by caging performers and positioning the audience as colonisers. This piece is iconic in performance studies as are other performance artists whose links I can share with you and you may be familiar with. But I was lucky enough to see this at the Tate um, Gallery in London. It was one of the first performances that made it into the gallery. So this was a live art event and crossing boundaries. Performance studies embraces an interdisciplinary approach and draws on multiple sources for its discourses and approaches. This is a tremendous strength, obviously, but also for critics, this is where the weakness lies and people are worried about its instability. In the next two days, we essentially have two uh, to three experiences to apply the performance studies material to. And these are the Beaton Institute, the Blue Mist session this evening, plus, of course, your own work and research. Performance studies often takes us outside the venue and into the public domain. My site-specific theatre practice is located outside in the public domain and um, the meanings produced by live performance and film are a reminder of that context and culture of the performance venue has a role in shaping our reception of any performance. Performance studies has been through an iterative process itself and its development began in 1970. There's a couple of books that came out between Theatre and Anthropology 85 and Performance, theater and performance Theory in 88, which were kind of um, touchstones, um, both by Schechner. A community of, of academics have moved the discipline forward, and I'm going to discuss the way that they've moved it forward today. Um, the role of the archive in capturing performance is a fraught question, and one that has been discussed and written about at length. Since archives are themselves selected to represent a point of view and agenda, and here we can see that our, ourselves, performance studies experts are keen to understand more about this. According to Jacques Derrida, there is no political power without control of the archive, if not of memory. Effective democratisation can always be measured by this essential criterion – the participation in and the access to the archive, its constitution and its interpretation. The root of the word archive is archon or house, and this can be understood as an address to which materials or official uh, documents are consigned. Place is very important, the place of the archive where the official documents are held. There is a legal implication here. The role of the institution is invoked in the concept of authority. The paper given by Derrida in June 1994 was at the Freud Museum and it, in London. It was called Memory, the Question of Archives. And Derrida noted that the home of Freud had become the museum of Freud. So that act of transfer, that transition is interesting. Derrida cites our unconscious memory in terms of the archive and... Um, uh, he says that it's useful to consider the role of the human unconscious um, as an archive of memories and then to look at how the unconscious selects and manages our memories, for example, through our dreams. In Schechner's book, Performance Studies, an introduction, he quotes Derrida at length. It's a very important concept for performance studies. Destruction, deconstruction does not consist in moving from one concept to another, but in reversing and displacing a conceptual order, as well as the non-conceptual order with which it is articulated. The concept of deconstruction permeates performance studies. The process of deconstruction allows us to reverse engineer and peel back the surface and see, reveal perhaps what a hidden agenda there is uh, there, the production of a canon of work to which value is ascribed in response to an agenda that may be hidden or explicit and perhaps find ways of making that agenda explicit. 
In theatre, the rehearsal of the canon is demonstrated in the programming of theatres where old masters are repeated, appear repeatedly in a determined effort to rehearse or remind the audience of a particular interpretation of value and importance. Derrida describes the archive in similar, similar terms to psychoanalysis, a bundle of limits which may have a history, a deconstructible history. So we're talking about something that's very active. It's not, it's not closed down. There's a space there to get in there and to analyse and deconstruct. We may want to consider the role of the subconscious and how identity is produced through memory to produce our personal histories, our bodies, our own archive. We know that understanding um, society, it's important to understand culture, the role of the archive in producing history in particular. And I just want to move on to that now. The impact of history on our bodies can be useful. It sometimes helps to offer a positive and negative example. So I'm going to role model just a little bit of um, uh, an example that has come to light about deconstructing the archive from a black artist uh, in the UK called Le Lubena Himid, who calls her body of work a handbook. So it's a very proactive uh, view that she has. She's not in the business of making work where I repeat the trauma. This idea of rehearsal is something that I'm very keen on, and I will... Um, sort of work towards that and um, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, important aspect in terms of finding ways to be proactive in the archive and Himid describes her work as a kind of handbook. I think it's a sort of car manual to deal with the ghosts of what has happened. So you can look at her work online, I can send you a link but um, there's a, a canon, really, of black artists in the UK who have made it into the art uh, genre, and they're, they're part of that. And uh, I, think, I think this is um, a, a proactive and positive story. This seems to be a good example of deconstruction in creative practice. Her quote encapsulates a proactive stance to resist erasure, so we're moving now on to Schneider and on to Taylor and the idea of the archive um, being erased. I have three key areas that provide the architecture of my presentation. These are saving, location and performance. Hopefully I can illustrate and discuss with you over the next couple of days both the failures and success of saving memory using this matrix. The key themes of visibility and representation underscore the thoughts that I share with you here. So what is saved, who by, and who has access? I've got many questions which I will um, be prompting our workshop with, but they include how does diversity play out in terms of ability of age, race, gender, sexuality in any archive? Is the archive under discussion canonical? Who and, what and who is privileged in this archive? The process of saving seems therefore to be a core activity in the production of historical narratives, artistic practices and practice research. And I'll be talking about practice research later and that may be in the papers. When I comment on the papers, I can say more about what I mean by practice research. I shared an article online um, which is called Patricidal Memory in the Passerby by Rebecca Schneider. She's a performance um, studies scholar of very long standing and you may have had a chance to look at her archive. But she talks about the archival process in both documenting history but also erasing history in the very practice of saving So this idea of um, the role of the monument and the monumental as a repository of history. She describes in that article 
an incident where she is standing next to a statue of Abraham Lincoln and a passerby takes a picture of her. She calls the, the statue a dead dad or a founding father. The statue memorialises patriarchal culture and goes on to argue in a nod to current thoughts on mobility and walking that the act of passing by has a role in contributing to the production of memory and therefore history. As she says in the first section of her article, she calls the monumental the edifice and the archive. So she includes monuments as another currency. She sometimes confuses the edifice and the archive in her own, she, she recognises that. And she says that patricidic culture is a culture invested in ensuring that the dead remain and the live pass by. So in terms of um, rehearsing history, in particular dominant histories, these are very generative um, approaches. According to this equation, that which is live or that which is not given to document disappears. It does not remain. It does not comp compose history. It passes away. So there's an erasure there. She cites Deserto. The passing faces in the street seem to multiply the indecipherable and nearby secret of the monument. So the idea of the passerby going past the monument, clocking the monument, actually holds that life of the monument. It keeps it going. It's a repetition. She explains how the live props, that's her word, or supports the archive, even as the live disappears. I'm carefully working through this article by Schneider to complicate the relationship between the live and the monumental or the archive and to build on this to demonstrate the scale of importance that I believe the place of memory, memorialization and legacy have for us in thinking about embodiment, documentation and the archive. So my methodology has, has been... Um, inspired because it appears that the process of saving is a core activity in the production of historical narratives, artistic practice and practice research. In an attempt to further interrogate and to resist the relentless weight of archival process in creating dominant histories, this kind of methodology has been useful, linking performative approaches to live performance, film and social engagement, I unearth and bring to life hidden biographies of selected women from history. And part of this has entailed turning the activity of saving on its head. My research leads me to suggest that the combination of live performance, film and social engagement has the potential to produce a living monument. My methodology started um, with Mary Wollstonecraft, the author of Vindication of the Rights of Women, published in 1792. My monument is produced on Newington Green, East London, where she lives and works. It is in the form of performance installations in galleries, outdoor screenings, book publishing, and especially curated museum um, exhibition. So it's multimodal. Who in the contact case, and I think we're enduring. So everything is put made a bit more provisional, supposedly enduring materials. For example, text, document, building, and bones. She puts in there and the so-called ephemeral, which we're dealing with, knowledge, developing the thinking on embodiment in the archive, Taylor points out that our embodied memory is often overlooked and written out by the process of writing itself. Her concept of the repertoire has become popular in performance studies as a useful way to discuss embodied practices. Her argument that the process of writing erases the repertoire of embodied memory is compelling and useful. She also says about the um, archive that written documents have repeatedly announced the disappearance of performance practices. So that's, it's very, it's very active, it's a bit like Schneider, they're very good at writing and it's very active, so the very act of writing announces a disappearance. It might be useful to say that um, 
the style of writing in performance studies is also very, uh, there's a lot of different styles. And that's very interesting in terms of trying to capture embodied experience. So she says succinctly that we're haunted by the literary uh, legacy. So that legacy is um, haunting us and perhaps uh, not allowing us to go forward in the way we'd like with an embodied uh, legacy of practice and knowledge. Um, when we go to the Beaton Institute, I've got the questions... Um, for example, how is the body, when we're here, represented in the archive? We can look, and it'll be represented well, and there'll also be failure. And performance studies are very interested in failure, so we're not just looking at good practice, we're also learning from failure. And also we want to talk about why the missing body matters, and is it missing? Taylor is very clear here that forms handed down from the past are experienced as present through embodied practices which offer as much explanation as written descriptions. So that's it in a sentence, that embodied practices offer as much as written descriptions, written explanations. This whole hierarchy is being um, eroded by Taylor and Schneider for very particular reasons. A dance ritual or a religious festival is given status through the repertoire. That's why the repertoire is so important as a valued means of sharing the past in the present. The writing equals memory slash knowledge equation is central to Western epistemology, Taylor says. And she quotes um, Mary Carruthers uh, as talking about the metaphor of memory. So a metaphor of memory as a written surface... So writing comes in there as the very um, uh, language, the very approach to capturing memory, a written surface for memory. But we might disagree. Okay, so I'm going to transition now into location and the importance of location. Um, I gave you a, a short clip of the March, um, uh, March of Women, and the film's called March. Local community is used and volunteer the content. Um, this process opens the archive to, to begin the process of deconstruction. And we find the social, the historical can be decoded and responded to. I think the response is the thing, the documentation response. And we had to um, spend quite a lot of time in working out the storyboard for that film in order to integrate a 100-year-old play, the participation of six real Scottish women who were profiled, plus 100 women who marched, plus the location. So it's multi-layered. We found film a very good medium for that. A, and we put another way, by moving beyond the domestic and interior space, and I know there's a conflation there, and I'm very happy to discuss it, a new opportunity is created to read and decode differently. As Wollstonecraft Live performed on the historic site, that was really my template for my performance research, my practice research, to find out how location worked. I, I worked very, very closely for my um, uh, PhD with a, another performance studies um, expert. I mean, she's, some of these people are fantastic in their writing. And this is Ellen Diamond, who has written a book called Unmaking Mimesis. And she... This is the Brechtian side of it. She talks about when gender is alienated or foregrounded, the spectator is able to see what uh, he, she, she, he can't see. A sign system as a, as a sign system. So we're looking at ways to alienate, distance, deconstruct, point out. Research through my practice and writing, because obviously our practice and writing, we can't... That's another debate, isn't it, about whether we can just do the practice... That's an, perhaps it's an old debate now, but I was certainly very engaged in that for a number of years. I've added to her reworking of Brecht to add performance and exterior public space or location as an example of Brecht, Brechtian distanciation and a recontextualization which can uh, offer a new reading. So Brecht, as you know, is the one who said, you know, the theatre audience must smoke and drink and stay awake and keep their theatre live. So I'm working off that. In summary, the site of performance impact on the representation or looking 
the site in its turn contributes to how the performance is cited, C-I-T-E-D, how a citation is created or a piece is contextualised. So that's diamond. And I've got these to work with. Um, we can look at these in more detail later. And that's just a provocation. You can ask yourself how you want to contextualise and cite yourself. What is useful to your work? In my chapter, Repetition and Performativity, Site-Specific Performance and Film as Living Monument, I ask how can repeated visits to one urban and historically inflected site create meaning for local and global stakeholders? Site-specific performance and film have provided my tools to, project, to produce a gender-inflected response to both the Wollstonecraft legacy and the practice of theatre production itself. I will quote further from the chapter to demonstrate how this methodology dialogues with performativity and the work of Judith Butler. So Butler is an important 21st century philosopher. They've been writing, I've got a date here, 97. It's been a number of years and a huge body of work. A prominent voice in the debates about the construction of gendered identities, but she comes from a linguistic philosophical background and Schneider... Uh, all the esteemed academics that I'm citing today have used Butler in their um, uh, development of their approaches. She's very, very significant. And I want to just try and uh, share with you why it's fragments and monuments and deconstruction. And it's about the fact that Butler insists that identity is created in the social space. It's, it's a fluid process but it is also a rehearsed process. So there are certain dominant meanings that get rehearsed. And through my theatre and performance, I've been looking at ways to try and puncture that, really, to resist that rehearsal of dominant meanings and find new meanings. So the iterative and distributed aspects, these are the words, really, iterative and distributed aspects of Fragments and Monuments projects in themselves, I argue, demonstrate where the repetition of the work itself has the possibility to interrupt the normative taken for granted rehearsal of dominant power relations that Butler argues against. I mean, one could say, channeling Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message. Okay, so um, performance and performativity very context, uh, very contested, the whole idea of performativity. And we'll look at that in as much detail, detail as we can when we're working together. But here, I'm just going to drill down a little bit. Five minutes only. I started about quarter past nine. Oh, jobs. Uh, find a place in a currency of uh, a capitalist exchange. Because it... It, it finds another route. It can't be captured. And she makes that point. She puts live performance right at the top of the pyramid as a radical act in her book, Unmarked. She talks a lot about loss. Her descriptions remind us how loss acquires meaning and generates recovery not only of and for the object, but for the one who remembers. The disappearance of the object is fundamental to performance. It rehearses and repeats the disappearance of the subject, who always longs to be remembered. And that brings us back to Derrida. So this idea of loss is hugely significant and why we want to save. She says, performance is independence from mass reproduction, technology, economically and linguistically, is its greatest strength. This is a quote from Butler, who is talking about the difficulty of not restaging old orders and is a leading trope in performance studies, where the role of repetition and rehearsal is expanded from theatre to a life lived. 
from analysis affects its own performance of erasure. <laughs> so there's another performance there. So offering a non-literal work in than to be too didactic about it. I gave one example, which is Libena Himid and her handbook, her artwork, um, which in itself deconstructs that trauma and legacy that she, as an artist, that's her art practice, basically. So what I'm sharing with you today, are basically starting points or inspiration for practice or for different ways of uh, interrogating and analysing embodied practice. <coughs> yeah, Heather. So I think that one of the big issues that we have when we're dealing with traditional um, cultural practices is the issue of change. And this ties into what you're talking about with saving. Um, so there's a lot of anxiety around the loss of traditions and that they've changed too much. And That's right. And knowledge of what, those root, what the traditional roots are, then we risk the loss of that whole practice. I guess what I'm really interested in thinking about, so if a performance is changing, mm. And if the archive itself is unreliable, is there a place, is there, what does performance studies sort of advocate for in terms of thinking about those roots or the, of how do we find that, um, that sort of practice, that historical practice, if it's changed out of performance and if saving it is an issue? Does that make sense? Just push it one other way. Well, I'm just thinking, for example, I'm doing person's role isn't talked about anymore, really, very often in contemporary practice. So it's not performed, and it's not talked about. How do I know about the history of this? Because it existed in an archive of uh, interviews that were being done about this. And I think it's just really interesting because there's a, a real um, pride here in maintaining traditions as they, quote, always were. And yet here we kind of have this really interesting evidence of change that is clearly happening in the way that square dancing is performed today, um, but that we can only think about, we can only start to get back to talking about what used to be there when we look back to the archive, and yet the archive itself is also incomplete, and um, as you commented in performance studies comments, it's, it's has its own issues of inclusion and exclusion. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, what is, if, if the archive is unreliable, is there a way, what way do we have to go back to um, sort of the roots of a tradition? Because the performance is also unreliable. Does that make more sense? But I think um, uh, the, it depends where you put the value. Because if you put the value on reliability, <laughs> That's going to be very tricky, and I think I think we've seen it in um, practice research um, PhDs, where you need to uh, position yourself within the work, um, and then to construct an argument yourself about the prov provisional um, characteristic of the work that you're research and your object of research, your object of analysis. Because I think reliability in the academy are tropes, I think, aren't they? That's what you're supposed to do, is to be reliable and to talk the truth. But I think increasingly we know that those archives are um, faulty and that gives us another whole um, field of research, really is looking at the gaps. I mean, I've got um, some practical uh, suggestions, and, and I'm sure you've thought of them already, but it's about setting it up, isn't it, with the caller and trying it as an embodied test, and then looking at that and recording it, and um, perhaps taking some uh, images of it. And one of the things that I've done is uh, something called strip analysis, which is sort of after Goffman. And it's after film, because in film you've got the frames, so you can analyse films frame by frame. But in video you can't do that, but it's often used as a, um, as a data collection tool. So you can analyse and motivate a strip and put what your argument is. So if you take a strip and then use that 
to argue your case. But I, th I think... Um, I think getting up and doing it, the embodied practice, and then looking at that gap is very useful, particularly as a dance as a dancer. That is, that is, that is, you know, probably really important. And of course, in the academy, which underscores this um, presentation, we've got this uh, body mind split. So I think we're also talking here about bringing those two things together and finding ways to um, give value to the image as a, as a data collection tool and to give value to um, a wider variety of methods of interrogation and analysis. So it comes down to actually arguing for your own methodology. I think arguing for your own methodology is, is really important, I mean, I'm sure you do that, but your example, I would suggest, is a, is a, is a tricky one, it's a contested one, there's a gap there. But to, just to finish, you were also talking about the difficulty of change. And I mean, may, maybe that's one of the most interesting things about the whole thing. And I think this is where the gateway opens into a more philosophical debate, because these um, aspects are philosophical. Change, time, it's, it's, it's philosophical, basically. And I think bringing that to bear on the practice expands it into, a, a, from my, my perspective, a wider, more interesting uh, canvas. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yes, Gary. Hi. Um, I wonder if you could just say a word or two more about the March project, which I thought would be very interesting. About Thank you. Maybe how you recruited involved this all Leah Pfeiffer who's well known as well. So I can I can definitely um, yeah thank you for that question. So um, we have to recognise that March of Women um, was a it probably took two years and there was a year of intensive work and um, it was a collaboration between the Royal Conservatory of Scotland and Glasgow Women's Library and Adele Patrick who's the lead at Glasgow Women's Library is a force unto herself. And um, I took my book uh, called Wollstonecraft, what's it called? Wollstonecraft Live Experience to Adele because they had a, um, an exhibition on Soggy Hall Street. Uh, I went up there and we hit it off immediately because our our sense of the role of the archive is very, really, we've got a lot of congruent, very, very good working relationship. But Glasgow Women's Library is a gateway because they've got the stakeholders. So I had a creative team uh, funded by Creative Scotland, and I can say much more about that. But I had, we, we, um, we have participated with people, it was a bit like this you would have bought a ticket but you would have participated. That was part of the ticket deal. So that was 2011. Then 2015 was expanded and three professional actors were um, uh, paid, you know, casting, proper, ca proper casting with a great casting director from National Theatre Suffrage uh, work. And then moving on to a pageant of great women and these um, workshops that happened. And it was a sedimented process. Um, and people were rehearsed and prepared in small groups and then brought together in the last week by me and a very good production team. And then on that day, uh, the 7th of March, the Carnegie Log and students and faculty mm. uh, archives and, the and um, those. Richard McKinnon uh, has been drawing on materials from, been drawing on resources and, and the experiences of music here. Ian Brody has been working on a project directly underrepresented. Find it's best to check our website in Celtic, Gaelic, traditional music, or folklore. Please feel free to contact me, Heather Sparling, or visit the CBU website.
Cape Breton Island is well known. On test fiddle style one in Athens, Alabama, and two old time fiddle style is that folks help shape how the intensification works in each environment. The tune of the day is Grey Eagle, and the performance I'll concentrate on is a recent one by Wes Westmoreland III at the 2017 Texas State Championship, so from last April. You'll hear and then see in transcription that Westmoreland's style is elaborate in historical context but that he has at the same time taken pains very performance because it's made it onto YouTube. Here it is, cold from YouTube. Here's what just hit Bray Eagle. All right. You heard a recurring strain and lots of other stuff. The, the tune was once just two strains, uh, these two. And already in the first surviving recorded Texas performance from 1929, there were six strains. Wes's performance looks like this on paper. Is this number two? Yeah. Too much to digest immediately for sure. The, the architecture of the performance is great, but that's, that'll have to keep for another day. What you see immediately is what you just heard. There's a luxuriant amount of detail. First, on the gross level, in most performances of fiddle tunes, North Atlantic wide, we expect two strains played in alternating pairs, maybe three. And that's true of Texas fiddling, even though those strains are then varied quite a bit. However, the very most popular dozen or so tunes tend towards more elaborate, unusually elaborate, basic structures. Grey Eagle is one of the fanciest in its basic materials and has become one of the top tier tunes. The ones played in final rounds of contests and also most played in the parking lot or the campground jam. We get more than the usual number of strains they've accumulated through history. Texas fiddlers talk so much about continuity about learning from their elders, about preserving not just tunes, but the flavor of his more focused attention. I detect that he is never assessors, by stars. Uh, 
first remember that Grey Eagle has more than two, and they're chosen partly for that reason. Then when the Star Fiddlers play them, variation kicks in on intimate and on really, really intimate levels. <laughs> I transcribed a bunch of performances as accurately as the recordings allowed. Then as sort of a mechanical first step in analysis, counted how many measures were duplicated precisely within each performance. Unsurprisingly, the percentage of measures having just the same pitches as earlier measures in the same performance decreased over the generations. What did surprise me was how steady the change was. I'll show you. First, here's a shrunken transcription of Wes's recent performance. And now scroll down, and I'm looking for an annotation that there's a repeated measure, and looking and looking, and we're scrolling, and there it is, finally, way down there before we repeat to pop out and reinforce your impressions. But then other factors will... I don't know whether this would be to your taste. It's something that came across my desk recently with musicians, uh, young musicians, it wasn't my idea. I think it's a very tried and tested idea, but I think it's a really good one, just because it um, increases, it, it provides a space where innovation and um, uh, transfer of knowledge and practice can happen. And I think cross-disciplinary, because we're in the context of performance studies, of course it's cross-disciplinary, and I think your case study is very interesting to performance studies scholars. And then I think there might be a, um, a next step which might be well what about opening this up for some collaboration which you as the expert would, would know how to do that, I wouldn't know, you know that's not me and do with me amount of stuff there to talk about and maybe that's a collaboration I don't know but maybe there's room for a conversation with heritage or people who are interested in um, heritage and food or crafts to, to look at that because it is very um it's very intense as you say and it's quite elusive to the analyst but if that's what your priority is to take the research onto another level and to make it more um expanded discourse based on a good methodology uh, the right, but it's um, at um, expertise in the three years of dancing these steps within I me. Mean, Thus, dance style into these two dance styles and two steps, the infamous two steps. And then I'll outline the ways that dancers of my generation would understand <laughs> these steps in relation to our own experiences and explore potential alternative understandings of these steps. So, uh, is it this one here? No, it's this one here, and it goes like this. No. Uh, yes. Until the 1970s, there were two distinct kinds of what was then just called Canadian step dancing, and that was to distinguish it ma mainly from Irish step dancing, uh, located in Ontario. One, what we now call the Ontario old time style, was performed primarily in southwestern Ontario. So down in this area, I'm from a little town near there. And the other, uh, th and that's the style I learned until uh, the early 1970s. The other, what we now call Aldo Ottawa Valley style, uh, was performed in eastern Canada, and particularly along the Ottawa River between uh, Ontario and Quebec. And this is the style I switched to after three or four years of lessons in the old time style. The origins of neither are well documented. There is some evidence to suggest that the Ontario old time style came from England and that the Ottawa Valley style is more related to Irish old time or Shano step dancing. However, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to further uh, unravel these links. There was little awareness of or contact between the old time and Ottawa Valley styles until dancers started t attending contests in other parts of the province in the mid-1970s. 
Judy Weymouth, who's now a prominent step dancing teacher, describes her first exposure to Ottawa Valley step dancing after five years of dancing the old time style. She said, we were just in awe and that was our first exposure to the Ottawa Valley reel. It was like, oh my goodness, whatever they're doing, we want to learn that, it's so cool. And I myself, I was probably eight, seven or eight at that time, I don't really remember seeing Ottawa Valley for the first time. But knowing now what the differences between the two are, I, I'm sure it was very impressive to watch and listen to, even in the 1970s and early 1980s. And it was quickly apparent to all of us from southwestern Ontario that this was a style we were going to need to learn in order to win at step dancing contests, which are held in relationship to fiddle contests in Ontario. So almost 100% of the contests in Ontario have fiddling and step dancing uh, at one after the other, and most participants at this point do both fiddling and step dancing. For those of us from southwestern Ontario, it was also fun and challenging to learn something so different from what we were used to. And so in the mid-70s and early 80s, there was a flurry of activity across the province as the southwestern Ontario dancers tried to catch up to their Ottawa Valley counterparts. Some of the Ottawa Valley teachers traveled down to southwestern Ontario and lived there for several months with various families teaching the style every day. Uh, at some point, some of the southwestern Ontario dancers moved up to the Ottawa Valley. They did, they'd go for a week at a time and take lessons for three or four hours a day and then bring it back to southwestern on the old time. After the, the teachers, including myself, who originally learned their dancing in southwestern Ontario and thus learned this reel and variations of it for several years, still teach it as one of the early dances when... Oops, not yet. Both styles have a basic step that is a, that is a series of footwork that equals one bar of music, which is repeated often throughout the dance. Some people believe that without the basic or a variation of it present in a dance, the dance cannot claim to be of a particular style. So if an Ontario old time step, which is generally eight bars long, doesn't have old time basics in it, it's not old time step dancing anymore. And in its simplest form, the Ontario old time basic is this, and I've written the <laughs> rhythm at the top there and, and the steps that, what we would call the steps, but it sounds like this, and one, and two, and so that's three, four, and step, shuffle, hop, touch, hop, step, shuffle, hop, touch, hop. That's the old time basic. The Ottawa Valley basic sounds like this. One and two. Hop, 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 so you can see there's a significant difference in the rhythm and, and so forth between those two steps. The Ontario old time starts on the beat, whereas the Ottawa Valley starts with a triplet pickup to the beat, the same way many fiddle tunes do, diddle do 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 like that, uh, adding more complexity to the sound. Very quickly after learning the old time basic, that's the first one up there. So that was the first one and the last one. I should have pointed that out. Very quickly after learning the, the old time basic, however, dan dancers are taught to change feet with a flap instead of a step, and that's going to smooth the dance out a little bit. And that is the second line of notation there. So it sounds and looks like this. One and two and See how it's a little bit smoother than the first one I did, right? Mm, advanced dancers now often use a shuffle to change feet, adding even more complexity to the rhythm, and that brings us to the two basics that are at the heart of this paper. So the old time basic with the shuffle added, which is the third line of notation, will sound like this. Uh, yeah. One and two and... And the Ottawa Valley basic at the bottom will sound like this. Really the same step. I'm dancing forward and back. The Ottawa Valley uses a side to side train. That's pretty significant in dance language. 
Secondly, the old time lifts higher off. It's high. Harder to observe is where the dancer's center of gravity is. In Ottawa Valley step dancing, it's much lower in the tailbone, we would describe it as, in contrast to the Ontario old time style in which the center of gravity might be closer to the sternum, for example. And I'm not sure you can ask for some of those differences. To me, they stand as um, uh, text um, in, in themselves, which are worthy of um, uh, reflection, I suppose. So another, another thing that comes up, which is very interesting in your work, is the uh, relationship between notation, your notation. And that would be another thing I'd say about this slide, is that at the moment we're seeing different modes, all separate, and I think there's a way all that can come together. So the notation, which is a form of writing, mm -hmm. um, it can dialogue more with the written and with the visual, mm -hmm. so that you get a really good dialogue going between those. And you find theory to fit the practice, and then you've got a really good recipe for um, how to understand the translation that you're talking about, I think. Um, you talked about reciprocal sharing and changes in style. And these are really big areas, and I think that they need to be um, cordoned off in some way and framed in particular uh, ways so that uh, we're not trying to do everything all of the time. I think you can. I think you, I think you could basically just um, make the architecture of it a bit more interactive, <laughs> actually. And then you can. And then you can see from your footage if you want to uh, how the transitions happen. Happen. And I have got a, an example of video being used to show shifts, which was um, with a young director, a PhD, uh, which is, um, and, and he uses uh, improvisation with his actors, and one night they'll do one thing, and next night they'll do something just slightly different, and it's like um, stop, start, motion capture, but you can see the shifts, and I mean, it's very basic, but it actually shows you what you are talking about. I think the value of the different modes of documentation needs to be argued for, and that's your methodology. Um, and I also think there's ways that your research would be cross-disciplinary, that other people would be interested in it. And I think that that's always a good route. For example, with the March, um, the health and well-being that's a very good outcome because it stretches and expands the work and it can dialogue with different people and different um, kind of communities. Uh, there's an overall question which you'd have to answer but these styles are distinct but does it matter? I don't know. I mean that's a philosophical question about change isn't it? So it's got more, it's more, it's more, it's bigger than it might at first uh, look like and I think it's interesting as well that the two um, presentations that we've had so far um, the structure is also competitive mm. and I think that that's going to come up a lot and I just think it's um, another aspect actually that uh, impacts on everything that you've said so thank you very much thank you, thank you. Well, we're not going to plunge on straight away. We'll just have a couple of minutes pause, um, allow people to gather their breath. We've had, a, we've had two excellent presentations so far and I think 
Anna's mention of um, competition, the, kind of the basis are behind the two contexts that we saw so vividly described and uh, analysed, um, gives us plenty to think about. Um, I've written down about four or five different points that uh, I, I hope to follow up later. You know, here's one for Chris to think about. I was I was interested in those other guys who are playing along with Wes. You know, so you 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 know. What were they doing? And why did we not see the audience? You know, these are other things, that, you know, things that, I mean, obviously you, perhaps you had absolutely nothing to do with the filming, but, as, you know, as Anna's pointed out, the filming, the video, uh, can be so um, elucidating on the one hand and yet so obscuring on the other hand because, yeah, we don't know what else is happening. We, we don't see the hall they're in from the video. We only have it from your description and, and so on. So I've got lots of thoughts um, which uh, I, I'd love to hear from Chris. And, and listening to, um, uh, listening to uh, Sherry there, um, I was uh, wondering, you know, suppose in the old style Ottawa performers you know, went like this to their audience and travelled? I don't know, but it's just a thought. I mean, you know, so much of the showing of the, uh, uh, of the Ottawa ones as opposed to the Ontario ones uh, is all about this sideways movement. So maybe, you know, it's this that needs to compensate for it. I know when I watch Shan Nose dancers, and here the movement in Ireland has been, in fact, to go back to roots, to look at archival film and try and restore some of the fundamentals of what Shan Nose dancing is all about, not to push it ever onwards into some sort of mishmash of hybridity. So uh, yeah, there's all sorts of complexities going on in the thinking and uh, I certainly wouldn't give up on Ontario old style for a minute, I think, <laughs> I think it's got plenty of merit. And, uh, Another thing just to throw in while we're, we're, we're having our little pause and I'm doing my monologue is uh, <laughs> somebody said, tell a joke. I haven't got a joke. <laughs> um, uh, another thing to think about is, in fact, um, the language of the dance. Now, in Scotland, we have no connection with how really how people did step dance. Um, as, as Matt said so vividly in his writing and Pat Ballantyne too, but what we do have is language. And so we have these things like tripling, tripling, mm -hmm. and doubling, uh, which are very sort of evocative words. And we also have things like um, Peter Dicker Haystack, Peter Dicker Haystack, which is what the dance masters used to teach their students to get different steps. And of course, it links in with Cantorac. Uh, which is something maybe we'll be thinking about as well. Okay, well, I think we're just about ready now, so we're going to move on now to our, our third speaker of the morning, and uh, someone in Scotland who is very well known through broadcasting and through his performance skills, but to us in the academic world, he is um, a professor uh, with a personal chair, in Scottish Ethnology and Scottish Studies at the University of Edinburgh and uh, somebody who's upheld that position with uh, great um, dignity and great success and uh, one of his recent publications was a volume called Voicing Scotland, a significant volume, well worth acquiring. Thank you, Gary West. Thanks very much, Ian, and uh, good morning to you all. And uh, thanks very much for the invitation to come here and talk. I managed to get through 50 years of my life by never coming to Cape Breton. I've no idea how I managed that as a, as a piper. Um, I play Cape Breton music, or try to. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here and to be here with you. Um, as a piper, I feel a bit of an interloper at an AFCO concert, uh, conference, but uh, great to be here. Around two years ago, I was handed a, a large folder of typewritten pages by the man who had been my main piping teacher from early in my childhood, a man called Jock, uh, sorry, Ian Duncan. Uh, Ian explained that the folder had been put together by his father, Jock Duncan, and they were wondering if I might have some idea as to what could be done with it. I opened it at a random page, <coughs> And the first thing I, I read was this. In 1914, we come out to meet the Germans in no man's land, Christmas Day, 
1914. We got on great. We swapped presents and fags and that. I gave a lad a tin of McConaughey's and he gave me a brown loaf, but I didn't care for it. Both sides took the opportunity to collect all the deed bodies and bury them. My, that was no picnic. Some of them were just in bits and the sting beat hell. What I had been handed were the testimonies of around 60 Scottish veterans of the First World War, collected by Jock, Ian's father, between the 1930s and the 1980s. He had visited them in their homes, got them talking about their memories of war, which was a very unusual thing to do by all accounts, wrote them down, then once tape machines came in, recorded them telling him their stories. He also transcribed every word with his two index fingers on a small archaic manual typewriter, mainly in his bedroom, mainly on Sunday mornings for 50 years. And in his representation of the words on paper never wavering from the rich, earthy and rapidly disappearing Northeast Scots tongue, which Jock himself shared with the men he recorded. Now I've known Jock all my life, having grown up with his other son, Gordon Duncan, who went on to become one of the most revered Scottish traditional musicians of his generation, indeed of any generation, there's Gordon. Uh, sadly, Gordon's no longer with us, having taken his own life in 2005. But his legacy is a powerful one, both in terms of his compositions, which are played by pipers and indeed Scottish or Scottish-influenced fiddlers the world over, and in his unique style and approach to his music, which has inspired so many of the next generation of players to follow in his wake, pipers in particular. The obituaries called Gordon a musical genius, uh, I'm not going to dis disagree with that. Gordon and I played, uh, learned to play the pipes together. We were just two years apart at the same school, although he learned at around double the speed that I did. And I watched on with immense pride as he took his music to the world and the world took to him. That Gordon ended up at the age of 41 finding that world just too hard to cope with uh, is an immense tragedy, of course, hard to take for all of us who knew him but of course heartbreaking for his family in particular, none more so than his mother, Frances, who just passed away earlier this year, and his father, Jock. And I'm delighted to say that Jock is still very much with us. He's now aged 92, also a performer of great significance in Scotland, in his case as a traditional singer. And Ian Duncan, my piping teacher, is recognised as one of the finest teachers and pipe band leaders of recent times, and that all three of them, Jock, Ian and Gordon, have been inducted into the Scottish Traditional Music Hall of Fame, we heard from Chris about Halls of Fame earlier, uh, is really to know how their peers have viewed their contribution to our traditions. Indeed, the only family, as far as I can tell, to have three members recognised in this way. I tell you all this by way of providing some background context to what I want to talk about for a short while today, because I did, of course, accept Ian's request to help make something of Jock's unique and hugely important collection, which really does constitute a life's work, or the best part of an adult life's work. So I'm working on editing it at the moment for publication in a conventional printed sense, a book, and I've given half a dozen or so public lectures about it. To me, though, this doesn't seem enough, or hasn't seemed enough. I felt it needed to be heard, to be seen, to be communally witnessed, and not just read off the page sitting alone. I felt it needed to be performed, rendered visceral, embodied, if you like. And I knew and recognised immediately that whatever I was to do with this collection, it was not going to be quite like any other project I'd ever worked on before. I've dealt with personal testimonies all my working life, being based in the School of Scottish Studies Archives at the University of Edinburgh, which since 1951 has been building up a collection of something like 20,000 20, hours of orally collected personal testimonies. None of them, though, have had the intensity of personal significance and none were likely to engender the kind of emotionally laden journey which I knew this project would be because of my personal collect connections to, to the family involved. So what to do with it? Well, I am a performer, as Ian said, but a musician. As a piper, I suppose, I've always been very aware of many different performance situations and contexts, aware of very different audience expectations and assumptions. Because, of course, with the bagpipes, the great Highland bagpipes, there's this very strong ceremonial association. Um, that meant by the age of 10, I had sussed out that there were times that our audience was far more concerned with what we looked like than what we sounded like. Sartorial correctness and bodily control and stature were everything to many onlookers. 
Together summed up in the phrase dress and deportment, Trek, check your dress and deportment, or marching and discipline. The music, it sometimes seemed, counted for nothing or very little. I have to say, um, against my better judgment, I love all of that stuff. Sorry, that's Ian Duncan, uh, the, the, my pipe major. Um, that's me in the front row of the Athol Highlanders. Um, Ian Duncan on the far side is pipe major. Uh, Gordon was a member of the Athol Highlanders too. So uh, the Athol Highlanders is all about dress and deportment and marching and, and discipline. But I have to say I love it. But by the age of 10, I'd also initiated, been initiated into the world of piping competitions. Again, contests uh, very much uh, in flavour today, I think. Both solo and band, where the music did matter and performance was dominated by concerns of technical accuracy, musical flair, whatever that might have been, stylistic composure, and everything was judged. And since then, having moved by my late teens more into the wider traditional music world, playing with folk bands, I've encountered many different performance situations. I suppose I've reflected gently on them from time to time, playing at festivals, which is very different from playing in pub sessions, which is very different from playing in large concert halls or recording studios, particularly where the audience is an imagined future one or the one <coughs> guy through the, through the glass with the headphones on. And also hosting a weekly piping radio programme on BBC Scotland for the last uh, 14 years or so, where the audience is there in the moment but unseen and unheard to me. And for all I know, they might not be there at all. Um, so I've certainly witnessed and taken part in different performance situations, although perhaps barely, given that long-term experience and background, I've never become a scholar of performance, or only very recently have I begun to tentatively explore that world a little bit. Uh, as a folklorist and ethnologist, that has been more often from the angle of tradition and ritual through the work of various people who have been mentioned today, the likes of Victor Turner, Richard Bauman, Richard Schechner, and then somewhat vicariously through my son's bookshelves, because my son Charlie is currently studying acting. Uh, so I find myself exploring the likes of Stella Adler, Cicely Berry, Barbara Hausman, Uta Hagen, Stanislavski, of course, and now through coming here of the works of Anna and some of our recommended texts uh, before we came here, and scholars such as Diana Taylor, who we heard about earlier too. And one statement of Diana Taylor's has particular resonance, resonance for me and for my journey so far with Jock's collected testimonies, when she said, um, performance for me functions as an episteme, a way of knowing, not simply an object of analysis. By situating myself as one more social actor in the scenarios I analyse, I hope uh, to position my personal theoretical investment in the argument. Now, I recognise exactly that. First of all, because for me, oral testimony, which is what I've dealt with most of my working life, has always been situated within the field of epistemology, the theory of knowledge, if you like, in that it is, amongst many other things, a vehicle for the acquiring of knowledge, along with perception and memory and inference. And there is much philosophical debate as to whether testimony can produce knowledge or merely transmit it. It's not something I want to get into right now. Um, Incidentally, the concept of epistemology, as you might know, was first introduced by a Scot, an alumnus of my own university, James Frederick Ferrier, who also, uh, even more interestingly to me, coined the wonderful term uh, agneology, the theory of ignorance, uh, something which I think if we look around the world today we perhaps should uh, revisit. So, taking the performance plunge, I decided to write a one-act musical play, or that's what it became, as a platform to allow these men's testimonies that Jock had collected to be shared and witnessed and experienced, or at least a representation of them to be experienced. Now, as you might know, Scottish soldiers are universally known simply as the Jocks, so the title more or less wrote itself, they are Jocks, Jocks. I'm not a playwright, nor am I an actor, so in for a penny, in for a pound, I decided to try to become both. I wrote it as a four-hander, as I think they say in the trade, but casting singers and musicians rather than trained actors, with the exception of my son Charlie, who is at least training to be an actor, and he is also a, a very competent fiddler. The cast, uh, from left to right, um, is Charlie West uh, on the left, my son, he's 18, myself, then two traditional singers and very fine speakers of the East, Scot East Coast Scots tongue, Scott Gardner and Chris Wright. 
And although I wrote a full script, we quick, quickly realised that we were far better at ad-libbing than we were at remembering deliver and delivering lines. The very first reading through at rehearsal we had, we decided uh, that we were actually really, really bad at it, except Charlie, who was really good at it. And he said to us immediately, tell you what, let's just go for what needs to be said more or less at any given time. Read the script, learn it, but let's not re try and reproduce it. And immediately it became much better and presentable. Um, now, the key thing for me when writing and staging it was that Jock himself and the men whose stories he collected should be the main characters. We were there on stage as vehicles to represent their voices. That's what we were trying to do, at least. So none of the characters on stage have names, but every time we quote from the testimonies, we take care to give their originator's name, place and regiment, as Jock always did in his typescript. Jimmy Reed, Afford, Six Gardens. The setting is a kitchen somewhere in Scotland in the present day where three middle-aged men gather from time to time to have a wee session, a few tunes, a few songs, a drama or two, and then they're joined occasionally from week to week by the young lad, no name, just the young lad, a fiddler, who arrives a little later than the others, lays a thick padded envelope on the table, and as he takes off his jacket and gets his fiddle out of the case, demands a dram, you need to earn a dram in this house, he's told, give us a tune, so he does, and we all have another tune. Before, he then is asked what's in the envelope, and he tells the tale, more or less reproducing my experience of having been given the envelope in the first place, uh, the difference being that in the play, um, he has been sent by a publisher, we're also going through this process, um, who are trying to trace the families because his great-grandfather was one of the men who was interviewed. Um, and so let's come back to that. He is Alec McCardy, Banff, enlisted, Aberdeen, age 17, Seventh Gardens, 51st Division, promoted to sergeant on the Somme by his major, who drew three stripes on the arm of his tunic with a blue pencil, awarded the military medal, wounded four times, posted missing, presumed killed after the great German push of the 21st of March 1918, family informed, but survived and returned to take part in the second man with the 51st near Rheem. Those words are exactly as Jock introduced him in his text. He provides a short biography of each man he interviewed at the start of the typescript. But in the play, they're delivered by the young lad standing to attention at the front of the stage, shouted in the manner of a soldier reciting his name, rank and number. I chose Alec McHardy as the key character because he is the one who emerges from Jock's text most memorably. And indeed, when I interviewed Jock himself, he was the one that he spoke about with the clearest unbridled and... Uh, Unbridled admiration, um, as you can hopefully... Uh, ah, right, this is where I need to... Right, so I need to click onto... Yes. All right, no, no, it's okay, I can do it. Uh, oh, no, I can't. No. Thank you. <laughs> he, he was a big hardy boy. They made him sergeant at 16. He, he, again, it was as if he would have up. 16. They made him sergeant because he, he, the, the, the CO says, send that boy over here. McCarty says, you're coming out of the rocks. Do you have pencil? Did you do any have pencil? And he got a uh, Pull up and some of something in the rock is three. Next week, come back and the party was still on the rocks. Mm -hmm. He just think he deserved it. The black man over there, he says, Got the three uh, stripes. Oh, I feel it. Aye. That was uh, his wife just at the end. You just heard typical interview situation. Cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted I caught that wee bit on, on, on recording. Time doesn't allow me to go into more detail about the play just now, but I just want to spend the final few minutes raising a few issues which I'm actively contemplating as we continue to perform it from time to time. The first is the point that I now wholeheartedly agree with Diana Taylor when she suggests that placing oneself within a performance helps us to understand. I embarked upon Jock's Jock's, imagining it to be a product of research, but I've come to realise that it is much better understood for me, certainly as a part of the process of research, because performing these testimonies has without doubt deepened my grasp and feel for these men's lives and loves and losses and laughter, 
For getting inside the text has allowed me to sink far deeper into the material in terms of its nuances, its subtleties, its emotion, than by sitting only with an editor's pen. But I do hope that this will inform my final approach to editing Jock's book for him and to help, it, help make it the best it can be, and I'm already uh, fairly convinced I think it will. I think it will be better, or I'll be better, than I would have been if I hadn't gone through this process. Um, I suppose I'll never know. Um, and I do already feel that actually it will improve my musical performance as a piper for one reason, because uh, in the, the testimonies, four or five of the key pipers of the First World War period are talked about. He didn't interview any of them, but they come up in the narratives a lot. These are men whose tunes, they composed the tunes that I still play today, uh, that all pipers still play today, the Battle of the Somme perhaps being the classic example. And I, I'm much more inside these tunes having gone through that process, and I do play them in the play on stage uh, than I was before. So, dipping into that, for me, very uncomfortable kind of performance zone with the play has certainly helped me to better understand, and in so many ways, um, understand from different angles, I think, but none more so than on the level of emotion. I've never quite understood the preoccupation generally amongst humanities scholars, of whom I am one, to assiduously try to avoid emotion. Emotions are surely one of the things that make humans human. Um, we are thinking, feeling, laughing, hurting humans. Why then, when we write about them, do we try to pretend we're not? This kind of objectivity. Um, because emotion is, of course, a constant in the narratives collected by Jock. And I think the understated, almost throwaway delivery of the tales of deep tragedy the way that they were delivered to Jock simply heightened that emotional impact on me, certainly. And we tried to give the play that same kind of laid-back, um, undramatic aspect when delivering some of these, such as um, this one always gets me. When we attacked at Highwood on the Somme, the German weir was a hail. Great Scots. The German wire, the barbed wire, was still whole. We couldn't cut through it. So we were losing an half a men. I flap it and keep it my head doon. But there was another lad at my side, and he raised up to get a perk at them, shot at them. I says to him, didn't he do that? Keep your head down into the ground. But nah, nah, he raised up, shot off a round. But nay mere, that was him, finished. Now, after the war, I was doing a bit of courting of the lassie that's now my wife. And eight times she showed me the photograph of her brother that was killed in the war. And I said, I can't far about this lad was killed. He was lying beside me at High Wood. John Rennie, Balmelly Farm, Turriff, Fifth Gordon. So the man who would have been his future brother-in-law was killed right beside him. But there's a lot of humour in there too. Alec Pratt was my sergeant, this is another one. He was a great character and a hard man. He knew all the ropes, being an old regular. Of course, most of these men were, were not regulars, they were drafted. A mind in France, he came round inspecting the horse lines and we were on parade standing by our horses in the early morning parade. Away down the line I heard Sergeant Pratt say, What the hell are you grovelling there making such a damn noise about? I heard the poor fellow say, The horse kicked me, Sergeant. Sergeant Pratt snaps back. Well, get the hell on your feet and kick the bastard back. <laughs> Excuse the language. Um, so, I have to admit to being particularly emotional two weeks ago. Oh, sorry, I did have the, uh, the text there. Um, when we performed this in front of Jock himself for the first time, I was very, very nervous. What might he make of this intrusion on his life's collecting? Um, might he think we were missing the point? trivialising the whole thing, making entertainment out of his life's work. Um, I needn't have worried. Uh, he genuinely seemed to love it. My daughter was sitting at the next table to him and watched him the whole time rather than the play, and she did say he had a smile on his face throughout it. Um, and at the end, when I sort of made clear to the audience that Jock was in the front row and thanked him for everything... Um, he stood up and just faced the stage and started telling all the stories all over again. Uh, nobody could hear him. Uh, it was a fairly sizable hall, so um, we quickly got, um, got him wired for sound with a stage mic, and I did a little interview with him um, about the process of collecting. Um, so that became part of the performance, of course, and um, of course that's not unusual to have question and answer sessions at the end of a performance, but it's nothing I had ever taken part in before. My field work had always been in a room uh, with someone offering you a cup of tea, um, as, as I witnessed earlier. Um, and that became a whole new part of the process, and actually Jock, being a performer himself, warmed to the audience, 
and it actually opened up far more than he had in private in his own home when I was asking about him, when I interviewed him, the bit that, the collect the, that uh, was from earlier. Anyway, to sum up, I am now intrigued about the use of performance within my field of, of ethnology, where rather than studying other people's performances, we might self-reflect on our own as part of the research process, as well as a potential product of it, of course. And it's raised many questions for me which I haven't even begun to contemplate seriously yet, largely questions to do with embodiment, for example, which remains something of a mystery to me, I have to say. I understand it more than I did before 9 o'clock this morning. Uh, I, on that note, actually, I did originally conceive the play as a radio play, and I still harbour ambitions to, to do that. Um, and if that was the case, what would, what would the embodiment aspect of that be when the voices are, if you like, disembodied from the bodies which spoke them? So I'm fascinated by that. Um, and what might the implications of performance be for my understanding of not just a personal collection of testimonies, a pers personal archive of jocks, um, but for a wider sort of national communal archive like the School of Scottish Studies with over 20,000 hours of material in there. How can it help us to better understand them, engage with them, make sense of them? We can't make plays about it all, of course. Um, but how can it help us to do justice to them in fresh and perhaps radical ways? Can it help us to challenge the authorised heritage discourse that's come down to us where, and it's Laura Jane Smith, you might know, who's talked about this a lot, where she says most of Western heritage is top-down, approved, authoritarian versions of heritage. Um, might this help us to look from different angles with the whole uh, intangible cultural heritage thing that's around now, of course. Um, and Anna touched on this morning in, on Derrida's idea that there is no political power without the archive. So I'm fascinated by some of these issues going forward. I don't know the answers to these questions and many other questions, but perhaps we can um, work on them as, uh, as we discuss things over the next two days. Thank you. That's, um, that's Jock in Hail Health, um, and that was him deconstructing our performance <laughs> at the end. Thanks, Gary. Um, so lots more food for thought. It's getting near lunch, isn't it? Um, I just think that uh, there's so many questions there and um, one thing I'd just like to start with is uh, a recognition that um, there are a lot of performers in the room and that performance is a very good resource for research, you know, the ability to perform, the ability to communicate um, because not all uh, researchers have that and that's a skill that uh, we've got and also presentation of it as well. I don't think you can discount those, those skills, really. And um, this is uh, an excellent example where you've also got a respondent who's a performer. So, um, as I know you're aware, the value of that is um, that can't be underestimated. So, perhaps reverse engineering it, but the um, radio uh, play seems to me to be coming out of here very clearly, and particularly when you were reading, Gary, the uh, particular Scots. I mean, it was just lovely, and I just think that um, I, can, I can go through uh, at another um, occasion some of the script development around, around the script, but I think it's interesting that your son suggested that you ad-libbed. And I think that that is a clue to what's going on there. And I think that, as you have noted, the um, practice research is a process. So there's been an iterative process here to get to where we are today, uh, listening to um, uh, some um, clips from that play. And the audio was very, very strong, it, you know, just the quality of it. And I'm a director, so I'm quite attuned. We've all got our own skills, but I could hear that, and I knew that that would be great for um, radio. And um, 
I've got quite a lot to say about the dramaturgy of the reading at the Scottish Storytelling Centre, but I think, I think from my perspective, I would see that as, as really good process, field work, research, and that if you, if you had the opportunity and it, um, uh, it... Because we always have to prioritise what our research is. I mean, there's so much of it. There's so much of it. I don't know whether that would just be summed up as part of the process and then we get to the outcomes now or what but I think I think there's definitely um, a huge amount that uh, this uh, multimodal um, practice research project uh, helps us to understand so practice research now Central School of Speech and Drama Goldsmiths Conference a couple of years ago that term has started to be used and I use it and I've been through the whole mill of performances research artistic research parap all of it I was there but um, I work quite a lot with Central School of Speech and Drama and I think practice research sums this up um, So, in terms of um, the language, uh, you're working from testimonies, which are writing. So we're in the we're in the world of writing, and that's your uh, world. And these um, they have been recorded. And yeah. then they're transcribed. Yeah, so they're different. So the early ones, Jock wrote down following conversations from memory, going back home and writing them. Yes. And then most of them, however, are recorded on audio recordings of various kinds. And Jock has then spent his 50 years transcribing them. So he's, mm. he's translated them from sound to words, if you like. Um, and I, I always felt that's very important, partly just the sheer labour that that took him. That, that, that's why I think the book is really important because that's what he's always wanted to do. Your book? Well, yeah, the book I'm editing, I think of it as Jock's book. Mm. But, um, yes, um, yes, because okay. that's what he wanted. That's why he spent all these Sunday mornings for 50 years transcribing it to make it a book. Um, and um, that's why I was slightly nervous that somehow he's, he's seen the play before he's seen the book, and I think he wants the book. <laughs> So, um, yeah, the, the, the text, if you like, is in different forms. Um, and mm. by the time they come into, come into the play, they've been, I feel like, transcribed or translated <laughs> several times. Yeah. So that's very helpful because there's a whole body of knowledge <laughs> that's happening with, um, in Surrey, University of Surrey. There's a, um, uh, there's a fabulous, um, she's much more than a theatre designer or a sonographer, but she's writing the Routledge book on sonography, which is basically art direction, but she's writing it from a historical point of view. But she is very interested in labour, and that's the word I want to retain from that, because I was very captivated by the typewriter, and scenographically, th theatrically, whether it's on radio or, or on the stage, it's that... That, so that now we're on to the embodied territory of this, and it's Jock's embodied effort and labour. So that's a really good example of embodied um, embodiment, and it perhaps isn't the most obvious example that we're expecting to come out with, but it, that's, that's the one that touches me, and it's also the one um, which starts to get near the emotion, and it starts to get near the loss. And we've talked about Derrida today, and um, we know that loss and saving uh, uh, go hand in hand. So I think that artistically, script-wise, those are notes, if you like, about where that uh, performance uh, could come from. And um, I can certainly respond to the... Uh, acting and theatre at another time. And that would be through a process of script development, which is what I do. Uh, but I work with actors. And the reason I work with actors is because of the embodied experience they bring to the text, to the words, because those words are just on paper. And it's not till you stand up and read it that the actor will tell you, well, yes, that's OK, but... But they will tell you, but they'll also show you. And that's what happened with you when you put this thing up at, at the storytelling centre, is that, and that's practice research. Unless you do that, you don't get it. 
Um, so I think it's probably time to uh, sum up. <laughs> But the multimodal characteristic of this research is of, of great interest to me. And I've used the word procession or processional or process because that's an iterative process. And I think we can um, safely say that we've got a really good example of a sort of living memorial to the people and the testimonies in the World War I testimonies. But it's also very... Um, it's very sedimented, isn't it? Because it's very multi-layered. You've got the writer, you've got the actual devastation of World War I, which came out of what we heard today. Um, and then just to respond to your um, uh, noted uh, value to Diana Taylor, your position in all this is obviously something that would be interesting for practice research and academic writing. So there's lots of different ways to coming into the same thing. And one of the things that happens is um, how to communicate it. But perhaps we can um, think about that a little bit more over the next few days or the next day. And just finally, out of the three papers that we've looked at, we haven't used the word genealogy yet. But that comes over very clearly as well. And that's very, very interesting as to how to demonstrate that genealogy, those moves. And I think it was Schechner's um, definition of deconstruction, which is the shift. And it doesn't have to be linear. It can be um, something else. All right, then. Thank you. All right, so we've had a lot of uh, intense conversation now between having these three really wonderfully diverse presentations, and yet there's so many connections across them, and Anna's feedback on those and Anna's original presentation. So now there's a little bit of time before we have lunch for some questions for any of the presenters or for Anna. Would anybody like to ask anything? Yeah, please, Gary. Chris, about, um, and I think you touched on this a little bit. Um, to what extent, in the clip we saw in the fiddle contest, would he have been extemporizing as he went? And I mean, you, you mentioned the the extra thing, and then his the other guy copied it. You know, uh, the extra little flourish. Mm -hmm. um, but he it, it sound, it sounded it sounded quite extemporized to me. Yes. And, and, and is that? It? I have for, not for that tune, but for, for some others seven to ten different examples of him playing yeah. the tune and they're all all quite different yeah and we were talking about competition earlier and i'm always fascinated with how things are judged and what criteria they're judged mm -hmm. upon or within but um would the level and the skill in extemporizing be be something that the judges would be looking for or? uh yes but none of the judges that i know could talk about that very clearly. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's all something that comes across as a flavor, uh, as often humor, uh, as often explication. All, all, never heavy-handed if it's successful, but always uh, eloquent and just so fast that you don't carry off a series of words with you thinking about what happened there, what happened there, you just go, oh, <laughs> because seven or eight things happened in two seconds. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, true. I wanted to ask also on a related issue, Chris, uh, having gone to Appalachian and the contest fiddle, I have probably a widespread kind of bias that I think you could challenge but Appalachian fiddling, at least the older ones, tend to be more um, intuitive. They don't tend to think about what they're doing as much or want to, whereas the contest fiddlers are a little more cerebral and kind of think it out, and therefore might not be as connected to local traditions. But again, I, I don't know if that's accurate, and I wondered if you could comment on that. There are lots of people who prefer one kind or another. Uh, I've spent enough time with each kind of southern fiddling to, to have lost the ability to, to favor one. Uh, one way I have achieved that is by not becoming a fiddler. <laughs> that there are so many uh, students of, of southern fiddling 
who have espoused a style and have become participant, participant observers. And then uh, they get certain advantages, but then they are always figure the style they play is the best one. Uh, as far as Appalachian fiddling goes, they're, they're, as you know, the two really broad schools, the, the folks that are essentially inheritors and the folks that are essentially early revivalists. And there are lots of cross-fertilization, too. Uh, inheritors who spend a lot of time on the internet, uh, urban revivalists who discover that grandpa was in on it, and maybe even find out, find, uh, find a few recordings. But in that broad division, uh, there might be more urban revivalists than inheritors today, if, if you compare Clifftop and Galax. Uh, Clifftop being essentially urban revivalist, maybe four fifths, and Galax, the, the reverse. And uh, those guys, uh, as far as intellectualizing and and uh, and articulating opinions, are far ahead of the Texas fiddlers. Actually, yeah, yeah, and they also play. Uh, that's also the environment in which there's the biggest division between the campground and the stage. That there's some styles of fiddling, uh, including, the, I mean, the Texas fiddling is in a way the very simplest philosophically, because it is essentially a contest thing that doesn't claim to be different, and because the campground and the stage are performances are nearly identical. Uh, at Cliff Top, you have old time fiddling and also a, a new fiddling branch. And then in the campground, there are some people playing samba and some people playing klezmer and, and, and tango and just having a good old time uh, with a greater variety. And that's also the urban revivalist. It's where there's the greatest uh, division between who goes on stage and who adamantly does not. It's sort of like at the so-called National Fiddle Contest in Weezer where you have this, this neighborhood called Stickerville that's old time players that never go anywhere near the stage. It's, they just draw on the energy, draw on the energy instead. I wondered if I could just ask, uh, put Sherry a bit on the spot only because I know that she deals so much with the competition circuit. And I just wondered, Sherry, if you wanted to observe if there are similarities or differences to what Chris has been describing in the competitions that you experience in Ontario. Yeah, I, I, both similarities and differences. And I'm just, um, we have, I guess I'm, I'm speaking from one style, so say the Ontario contest. And, and I've been to ones across the, the country, but my, most of it, my experience is, is in Ontario, where we most of the contests, it sounds like, would be similar to the Texas style, where there's not so much of a divide between the campground and, I mean, there's always a campground, and it's yeah. very important, and arguably the most important part of the contest. Mm -hmm. um, not so much divide, but then we have this one contest at the end of the season in Pembroke, Ontario, the Ottawa Valley, heart of the Ottawa Valley, and there's where we get our influx of people playing French Canadian styles or, or uh, Appalachian, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people going and not, but not going to the actual contest, but just coming to, to, to as you say, feed off of the energy and the, and the, the opportunity to gather. And uh, so kind of both happening within the one community, uh, but in, in terms of place and I think time within the season, I think it's significant that it's the Labor Day weekend, uh, right before everybody goes back to school and such, that kind of is the culmination of the season um, that becomes something different, very, very different than the others. Sorry, was it Ian? Yes, I think you had a question. Um, my question sort of... Um, is towards both Anna and Gary. Um, listening to Gary's absolutely fascinating account of uh, his um, coming across these documents through Jock Duncan and so on, um, it, one th and the fact, of, uh, as Anna so rightly stressed, that the, the multi-layered nature of the, of, the, of the data that he encountered, 
uh, one thing that perhaps Gary would, might be thinking about is the way that it's framed. He has thought about it, but we haven't actually used the word framing, have we? And I think that that is something which um, I would bring out of uh, his practice-based approach. And the other thing that um, I think that I would uh, personally, it's always something as an ethnological researcher, field worker, is this notion of a pathway. Not so much the pathway of the supposed, inverted commas, speakers of the documents, but the pathway of Gary himself as he encounters these different um, uh, pieces of evidence, different experiences, and so on. And uh, what I'm leading towards is a question, and that is the discussion at the end that Jock led, the commentary that he gave, the critique, how, uh, will that affect what you might do in the future, Gary? Will that impinge on any further development? Or does it simply reinforce? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I hope it will, and I think it will. And um, my son Charlie was sort of quick enough off the draw to stick his phone on uh, to record it. Because we you know, obviously it was just spur of the moment, so I do have a recording of the conversation, uh, which of course then makes it make another part of that whole thread. <laughs> which I mean, the whole thing started as recording, so I quite like that the fact that there was a new performance of it and we managed to capture that. But I think the the moment that moment for me was in the moment that it was a lovely moment. It was a lovely moment for me certainly, and the audience seemed to respond to it. Where the guy who made it all happen was there and. Um, it was the way you just started retelling all the stories again. Um, and so to answer your question, you know, I, I'm sure it will influence what I do with it and how I present it and how I frame it. I don't yet know how, <laughs> how that influence will take shape. But as far as the framing is concerned, um, obviously by placing it on a stage, there, there is a, f a literal frame there, if you like. And actually, I don't know if you, uh, in the photograph of the Maybe just put it back if that's okay. Um, so this is, the, we did it in the village hall in Blair Athol. This is a kind of, um, just normal sort of early 20th century village hall. Um, but we went up and wrecked it beforehand and Charlie and his friend, um, his mate who's actually at the RCS doing technical theatre, um, said that we need to make this, we need this to be special for Jock. Um, so let's make it like a theatre. So we, we borrowed uh, the, the blacks from the Edinburgh International Festival. I'm not sure if they know about that. But this, it's, not, it's not as if this is being podcast all around the world. <laughs> um, and um, just tried to, so actually the framing was a, was a very literal framing that took us from half past 12 at lunchtime when we finished it at 10 to 7, just as the audience was coming in. Um, and we all fluffed our opening lines because we just... <laughs> and um, so the, the framing bit was, that's a very interesting point, Ian, because I was very aware at the time that this was, the framing was a physical process mm -hmm. that day, and I'd never thought of it that before. I'd always thought of framing as something, you know, contextualization, if you like. Mm -hmm. but, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, I think there's so many ways to think of the framing, put it that way. But for that day, for me, for us, given the labour involved, it was a very literal framing. Um, and, and, um, and it was a good night. Uh, and the raffle on the left-hand side, as you can see, so that's not part of the, that. I was going to say, were they our additional readers? No, that, that was... Um, <laughs> they were passing tickets. It, it was, it was a classic... Classic uh, village hall raffle, which took about an hour to get through, because of course neither the person reading the tickets or any of the audience can see anything between them, whatever. And you had the, the usual thing of discussing what colour tickets were and all of that. <laughs> that was a performance. Yeah. And it's the last vestige, of course, of the colour. Any ra raffle, I don't know what it's like here, but in Scotland, it's the only time you'll ever get a colour called buff. <laughs> it's amazing. You'll, you'll have to ask us about the chase, the ace, and the, oh, the problems yeah. with colour. And that's part of the um, theatrical canon. So by doing that, you're engaging with theatre history, which is what, one thing. And then what Ian said about um, framing your research, I think, is another thing. But um, I think it's Goffman again that talks about the frame 
so much. And I, th I think that it's hugely important, but I also think, um, <laughs> I don't want to overuse this word, so I'll just say unpick and sort of deconstruct, but I think being clear about what the role of both those things are is, is part of the research methodology, basically. Yeah. Which I think is probably where Ian was going with his question. But anyway, I, do, I just want to contribute that because that's what performance research is so interesting about, is the theatrical framing and, and how that um, gesture, that statement, makes you start to engage with um, theatre history and the canon. So if you're, if you're from a critical standpoint, you're going to have to then critique that. Mm. It's exciting. Chris? And I was also trying to bring out uh, this, the question that all of our contributors have commented on and been aware of, uh, and that's uh, having this reflexive approach to research and realising you impinge and affect what's happening as well as observing what's happening. Yes, that's right. Related to framing, uh, having a good bit about contests, sometimes that's criticised that's as an elitist thing, um, and contests do overall improve some some uh, technical level of performance, but they're also the very most egalitarian forum I can think of, because you can't have a contest without the mediocre and the poor participants, who then are encouraged, and, and also the usual contest, uh, oh, that's pretty broad, uh, mm -hmm. has, has age brackets. And that encourages the very young and the very old, and encourages uh, generations of a family being interested in the same activity. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, made, well made that point. Very true in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'd like to ask one more of Sherry, actually. I'm just wondering, because um, Sherry and I know each other's work pretty well, and Sherry uh, knows that I've dabbled with Cape Breton step dance, but I'm not a, a particularly proficient dancer. Um, and I'm just curious because you have done Cape Breton step dancing as well, lots of lessons. And I'm just wondering how does this knowledge of out other dance forms also inform or help you to better understand what you're either feeling or seeing or sensing as the differences between the Ontario old style and the Ottawa Valley. I'm also wondering if there's maybe some kind of continuum that's sort of happening here. We started exploring um, connections across Canadian forms of step dance, and I'm wondering if maybe this is some of what you're getting at is helping us to start to sense where those similarities or the continuities between dance forms and the subtle, maybe some subtle differences as opposed to major differences might be. Right, and, and I think, uh, I guess it was the, the conference that we had here, I guess it was, a year and a half ago that um, made me start thinking about feeling, mm -hmm. feeling what it feels like. It, and that's not something, I mean, it's crazy. I've been a dancer for 40 plus years and I hadn't thought about what it felt like to dance. And um, that experience is, I, I, I previously was thinking about what dance looked like. Right, or how it related to music. But now, uh, discovering that there's different feelings and that how one holds oneself changes according to different styles is, is providing a whole bunch new of, of new data, but also realizing that that is a very personal sort of thing mm -hmm. and that how I experience that is going to be different than even somebody who started dancing the same time as I did and has done all the same contests and all the same styles of dancing it's going to be very different and so then what's the worth of that I mean and I think there is but putting all that into context I think is is important but just having it available as a tool I think is amazing. All right, so this brings us to the end of our sort of more cerebral exploration of various aspects of performance studies and some really, um, I think, some pretty uh, interesting and rich presentations from our presenters today. I'm sure we'll continue to refer back to them through the rest of today and tomorrow. 
But now we get to eat, and we get to renew our bodies so that we can do more performance this afternoon. And we'll be coming back into the Beaton to do some more interactive activities um, this afternoon. I think we'll have a, it'll be a great deal of fun. So we have lunch for everybody here over in the multipurpose room. So please join us there, and uh, we'll come back here for 1.30. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> in that clip, there were four, four guitarists.